Revelation chapter number 17. Now, if you'll remember last week, what we talked about in chapter number 16, how there was reference made to Babylon and how Babylon had the cup reserved for them that was full of the fullness of God's wrath. It was the most wrathful part of God's wrath, if you will, the creme de la creme. It was set aside in a cup reserved for Babylon. Wasn't talking about a country. It's talking about a mentality, a doctrine, a dogma, if you will. And then in chapter number 17, which we're getting to today, we see the final fruition of that Babylon. In fact, it's called Mystery Babylon in chapter number 17. Now, to get you guys where I'm at, it would take a very long time, but To clarify something I said last week, the mentality of Babylon is not solely residing in the Catholic Church of today. Okay, that is a mentality that is older than possibly any nation on the face of the earth. Okay? It existed long before the flood where Noah was. But the Catholic Church is the if you will, perfected form of the mentality that Babylon birthed. Okay? We can go back. Here's just a fun fact for you. Okay, I know we're in the end times, but here's a little bit of Old Testament fun for you. Okay? You can go, you can look at the Moabites, you can look at the Hittites, you can look at the Amorites, you can look at the Babylonians, okay? The Philistines. You study all of their gods and their pantheon of religious figures, and you're going to find a whole lot of similarities between them. Okay, we're all mostly familiar with the Greek and the Roman mythology. What the Romans do? They came in, they stole everything that the Greeks had, and they just gave it new names. Okay? All throughout history, there has been a mentality, the way that you control people after you conquer them, after you come in and you burn down everything that they have, you show them that really you're more alike than you are different. And then for whatever reason you had to do that, but now you're part of the family, you're one of us, everything's good. Okay, now that you're a part of our people. One of the easiest ways to do that is through religion. Okay, now, do you think it's any coincidence that so many of the nations that Israel fought against in the Old Testament have supreme deities that have a name starting with B and ending with L. Sometimes it's B-E-L, Bel. Sometimes it's B-A-A-L, B-A-A-L, Baal. And there's a whole bunch of different iterations in between. But all of them are talking about the same sucker. He's just got a different name in each culture. They spelled it a little bit different. Okay? They all have the same backstory. They all have the same likeness. They all supposedly have the same power. Well, why do you think it was so easy for Nebuchadnezzar to come in, take over all of his known world at that time, and everybody just get along and be okay with it? Well, it's because they all bought into the same religion. You know why that was so easy? They basically said, no, it's the same guy. You just got to call him by a different name now. They're like, oh, that's fine. Yeah, we're all good with that. Well, Brother Jordan, why are you bring that up? We'll get to it here in a minute. Just remember that. Okay. Chapter number 17 of the book of Revelation. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the king of the earth have fornicated, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of 
names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones, and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and here is the mind which hath wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five are, fa five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue a short space and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And they have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I will stop there for a second. The angel takes the Apostle John, and he says in verse number 1 down through verse number 4, he says, there is a woman, okay, not literally, but... The implication is that this woman had no power but has used her wit, her guile, and her deception to where now she has been given power by others to where now she's more powerful than the ones that individually gave her a little bit of power. Okay, she wasn't born with any power. It was given unto her through choice by other people. Keep that in mind. And then it says that the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. She deceives them. She does it through illicit means, meaning ways that aren't right in the eyes of God. Okay, remember in the Old Testament when it talks about the Hebrews, that they were guilty of forsaking their first love and that they had committed fornication with idols and idolatry in the groves that they had set up. What's it talking about? They cheated on God religiously. They had pledged themselves and promised themselves to serve God always and faithfully. And what did they do? They broke that vow. Well, here it says that the kings of the earth, past tense, gave power unto this woman. And little by little, she got a little power from one and a little power from the other and a little power from the other. Because if you're smart, you don't give somebody more power than what you have left with. You think you're in control. You say, yeah, I'll give you a little. But what'd she do? She went and committed fornication with another, deceived them a little bit, deceived another and another until eventually all the power that was given unto her was greater than the power of any of the kings that originally gave her a little bit of power. What has she done? She has made other people committed to her. Why? Because they've given unto her. They've hitched their cart to that horse, so to speak. But now the horse is in control, and they're stuck along for the ride. Because if they try to back out now, she's got more power. She could destroy them. But it says that even the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, meaning the fruits of all that power that she's been given by kings, is that she's been able to deceive or to blind, to make drunk the rest of the world where they don't understand the situation that they're really in. That's why it's illegal to drive a car under the influence of something. 
you don't really see the world as it is. Your perception has been altered. It's inaccurate. You don't see the truth. And because you don't see the truth, that's why you're doing this when the road is straight as an arrow. Right? You're under the influence of something. Well, what are these people under the influence of? They're drunk on religion. They've been blinded and they can't see the truth because of the fruit of what this woman has done. They've been hoodwinked. Okay, as the New Testament will tell you, they've been made twofold the child of hell. They think they're all right, but really all they are is twice damned to hell. Once by sin and once by what they have believed in. But it says, So he carried me away into the spirit in the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. The beast is full of insults, lies, and deceits about God that's what blasphemy is to say something about God or against God that is not true why do you think it's such a sin in the eyes of God to take the name of the Lord in vain his name is not to be used as name the men down here his name is not to be used as a curse or an insult or a promise of violence no his name is holy it's blasphemy to use the name of God in vain you're taking God and bringing Him down to a human level. That's not your name. It's not your name to use. The only reason we use it is because we are commanded to use it to give honor and praise unto Him. And we use it to show our reverence when we do speak to Him that we would use His name in a reverential manner. So yet this beast is, doesn't just have a name of blasphemy. It says He's full of names and of blasphemies. He says, if you want something that will tear down or to attack the holiness of God or to change people's perceptions about God Almighty, Jehovah, he says, I got one for every each day of the week and two on Sunday. He says, I'll come up with a new one if you really want to use a new one. Everything that this beast is about is to attack the deity, the holiness of God and his son, Jesus Christ, and his mediator, the Holy Ghost. The one who takes things from God and brings them to us and takes those things from us and takes them back to God. It's to attack the Trinity so that men, what, get drunk on what they've been taught. They don't see the truth. Then it says that that beast that she's sitting on has seven heads and ten horns. It says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now purple all throughout the Bible, has always been identified with royalty. When they mocked Christ in the hall of praetorium, what did they do? They wrapped him in purple, saying, did you say you were a king? Well, right now we just literally beat the life out of you. Said, you don't even look human anymore after what we've done to you. So here, let us wrap you in purple and we'll bow down and we'll worship you. Well, the color does not proclaim what she thinks of herself it's what the world thinks of her remember she had nothing but through her deceit she was given power from kings and people pay tribute unto her because of her power who gave her the purple people where'd she get all that fine raiment at people made it for her. people went out and got and then brought to her just as the kings took from their power and gave unto her Okay, it says, and scarlet color. Scarlet is always a picture of sacrifice or of blood. Only in this case, she is not robed in scarlet because of the blood of Christ. Right? Christ is always identified with scarlet. Why? Because of the blood that he shed for her. This woman is robed with purple, meaning royalty, but the, before she was, quote unquote, placed on the throne by the kings and by the world, the rest of her clothes were dyed with the blood of the saints. These clothes weren't brought to her scarlet. That's what was left over after she had gone to war with the followers of Christ. How long has that war been going on? Long time. 
But at a certain point, people realize she won the fight. Let's make her queen. Let's make her royalty. Let's robe her in purple because she's the strongest of the strong. She won the king of the mountain, if you will. Well, it says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She was arrayed in the best that the world had to offer. We don't have time to get into gold and precious stones and pearls, what they represent. But it says she has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. What does she consume? We know what she's putting out for the rest of the world. It's wine to make them drunk. But what does she consume? What does she take delight? in partaking in well inside of her own cup which she would drink out of it says it's full of abominations filthiness all as a result of her fornication what does she delight in she delights in taking things that God initially had as simple pure and holy and twisting them defiling them into all manner of filthiness she delights in the wicked the seat or the wicked desires that are in the seat of people's emotions at your heart. She says, give in to those things that your heart truly wants to do. Your heart is deceitfully wicked, the Bible says. She takes delight in things that people couldn't have imagined, but yet they become a reality out in the world. She takes delight in all manner of the finished products of sin. She doesn't care about how it gets there. She enjoys being filthy. And then, it says she enjoys abominations. You know what abominations are? Things that God hates. If God hates it, she loves it. She consumes it. She lives off of it. It says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Let's back up. Mystery, meaning what? That for a time, God has allowed it that no one's been able to truly identify the true intentions of this woman, metaphorical woman, that John sees. God has permitted it. God doesn't tell you who she is. God doesn't give you a name. God gives you some clues. But God doesn't give you the answer. If God did, some people still wouldn't believe anyway. It says mystery, meaning what? Unknowable. Even if you got down to the bare, if you were there the day that something was conceived, right? The, the idea took place. If you were there in the back rooms where all the people met together and said, hey, let's make a new religion. Even if you were there, you wouldn't see her. Why? Because it's mystery. It's unknowable. It's something that, just like the beast that she rides on, came straight from the depths of the bottomless pit. It's an idea and it's a concept that slowly takes shape and takes root until eventually it gets to the point that she's the woman arrayed in fine apparel and scarlet and in, in purple. She's got all the riches of the world adorning her. She's got a golden cup that she's partaking of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. She's out there and she's got, according to the world, all power. She's stronger than any king upon the face of the earth. Well, it says mystery... Babylon the Great. I told you. Last week gave you an analogy. Babylon, at one point, had many of the world's religions that they had conquered. Go study out your Bible where Nebuchadnezzar comes in and takes over Israel. What's it say that he does with the wise men of Israel? He gathers them unto himself ships him off back to the king then he sets him aside for a while he says I don't want any sickly 
I don't want any that don't meet up to the mental standards that we've got. He says, I want wise men, the best of the best. And then after those wise men were weaned out, if you will, we've still got Daniel and Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. What are they doing? They were meant to be advisors to the king. They were meant to be representatives of the king. Where do you think that Nebuchadnezzar usually sent all them people back to? The land that they were from. What were they a picture of? That the king was merciful and that the king, instead of sending, you know, vengeful or angry or mean taskmasters, he sent back one of their own. To do what? Keep them in subjection. How did he do that? He took all of those disparate religions and he turned them all into one. Y'all remember the scene? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They're looking at an image of what? This newfound God that Nebuchadnezzar had erected a statue of. Said there's a problem. It looked just like Nebuchadnezzar. He tried to pass the law. He said, when the horns blow and when people shout, if you don't bow down and worship that, he says, you're dead. They said, dude, we're not worshiping you. He says, no, 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 it's not me. Maybe you didn't hear me the first time. He says, that is the God. And he said, our God don't look like that. You can't look at our God and live. Moses could barely stand to look at all of his glory. We're not doing it. Then what happened? Nebuchadnezzar threw him into a furnace that had been heated up hotter than it ever been. Then he got a visage of the Son of God. Then he realized that thing out there isn't God. But what was he trying to do? He was uniting all of those other religions to say, this is the God that we've all called by different names. See, I've got all the wise men with me, and they finally figured it out that this is what he really looks like. You call him this, and I call him that. And your people called him this, and long ago the Egyptians called him that. But really, what we identify him as is the one that has all power and control. And everybody's like, oh, that makes sense. That sounds right. Yeah, of course people would call him by different things because they spoke different languages. And of course, everybody around the world was smart enough to know that there's one God that's in charge of everything. Why isn't it that God? Well, it says Babylon the Great is a name for this woman that's out in the wilderness. Why? Because she's done the same thing. She has deceived all the kings and all the nations of the world into believing what? That their God is the same God that she claims to represent. That her religion is the true religion. That her religion, everybody can come in and work, regardless of what you call them, we just understand that he's the one that's in charge. And I am his representative here on earth. It says the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots meaning what? Fornication of religions. Two coming in and then one coming out looking a little bit different. Yeah, we'll take a little bit of you, we'll add it to this, and then this is the newest version of the religion. What are they doing? They're mingling religions of the world into one universal religion. Then it says, and abominations of the earth. You realize that some of the most heinous things ever done in human history were done in the name of a religion? A lot of what the Nazis did was rooted in the occult and their religion. Communism comes from a place where they won't admit it because they don't want you to believe in your God, they just want you to believe in their God. It's a religion. It's called humanism. That's where man is the God. So many things throughout history were all done in the name of a God. Well, this woman, she's not only the mother of the harlots which made those commingling of religions. She's also the mother of abominations. 
Where do you think they came from, that cup that she drinks of? She came up with the idea, got somebody else to drink it, and she thinks it's sweet to her tongue. She can't get enough of it. It says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Told you. She has gorged herself on it. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. It's more than just what she could control or contain. She's taking as much as she can get her hands on. In fact, a symptom of a drunkard is that they have a craving for it. They can't stop themselves from going and getting more of it. That they are addicted to it. When it says she's drunk on the blood of the saints and the blood of and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She wasn't just happy enough to go out and eradicate them. She turned them into martyrs. Go study what a martyr's death is. You're not a martyr if you died in your sleep. You're a martyr if they parted you into quarters. And they didn't do it with a blade. They'd attach a horse, two to your ankles and two to your wrist. And then they'd scare all the horses with a whip. And what'd they do? They ran and they kept running and running until what? You came apart. They'd be subject to things like the guillotine. A martyr's death is not peaceful. It's always violent. To eradicate the saints and what? Martyrs of Jesus. It wasn't just enough for them to die. They had to die in horrific ways. Why? To put fear into other people that saw what was happening. She controls through religion and she also controls through fear. The threat of violence. <clears throat> it says, And when I saw her, I wondered with great, ad great admiration. Meaning that John, the apostle, through the Spirit, sees this and he goes, how in the world? Who is that? How'd she do it? Right? How do you take something that Christ started? This is John. He saw Jesus do all the miracles. He was there in the crowds of all the people that saw Jesus do all the miracles. He says, how did somebody take what God did? And how does it get to that? He says, how is that possible? The angel said unto him, Wherefore didst thou marvel? He says, don't think that it's so unbelievable. He says, don't think that this is some, you know, great or mighty thing. He says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her had seven heads and ten horns. He says, you don't need to wonder about it. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Verse number eight, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Stop. What did God tell Moses out of the burning bush when Moses asked who he was? He says, I am. Every time that it mentions God, it says that he's the God that is. Right? God is the self-sufficient God, but he's the living God. That has been as I that's what the name Jehovah means. That only he is God because he's the only one that has power to be God. God wasn't. And God won't be, God is. If tomorrow comes, He's going to be God. But He's God now. Well, this one, this beast that she's riding on, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. What's that mean? It had its time, but it ain't around no more. You know what that tells me? Not God. It says that that beast was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Hang on a second. He said it was, but it's not no more. He says, and is not. Then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, meaning talking about the future. What's he saying? This beast, it's a deception. It's smoke and mirrors. It says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast 
that was and is not and yet is. Y'all remember the Antichrist? When it gave a depiction of what that beast looks like? How he had a head that was wounded grievously unto death, but yet he was still living? Well, see, way back in the day, there's a whole bunch of false religion. It was. And then there came a day where God said, This is my son, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And he turned the world upside down with 11 followers and one that was of the devil. Then the early church turned the world upside down. What was it proven that the beast was a lie? He was not. The devil got hit in the head so hard that what? Everybody thought he's dead. But then it says, and yet still is. It came back. Ha! Y'all thought I was dead, but I'm not. I was stronger than the one that tried to kill me. It says, all those that don't have their name written in the book of life shall wonder at the beast. They take it as a sign of his power. Not realizing that God just for a moment says, I'm allowing this to happen for a reason. And here is the mind with that wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Never understood how any church would want to call itself seven hills because the seven hills are identified with mystery, great Babylon with the very woman who's responsible for killing the saints and martyring the followers of Christ I also don't understand why anybody would want to have Corinthian Baptist Church either but anyway lots of problems going on there so much that Paul wrote two books okay But a lot of carnality in Corinth. Well, what do you think Seven Hills is full of? It's full of abominations, and it's a form of, or full of harlots and full of fornication. It's full of everything that God doesn't stand for, where this lady comes from. Now, it says that these seven heads, okay, the seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, meaning that there are seven places that she has power. You know where God sits? On His throne. God's got one throne. You know where He sits? In the sides of the north. There's nobody above Him. Nobody can come close. Well, this woman's got seven seats of power. If I wanted to, we have less than enough time to even mention it. We could go through the history of the Catholic Church and there used to be seven places over in Rome where people that had authority over seven different parts of Italy each had their seat and all of them gave those seats to a thing called the Catholic Church where there once were palaces now there are great cathedrals and inside of each one of those cathedrals is a seat one of them the Pope calls his official high chair. It's not in the Vatican. It's out in Rome on one of them seven hills. But those seven thrones throughout the Roman church, what she, she sits on them all the time. She still wields all the power that was given to her from those seven thrones. It says, verse number 10, And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. Meaning what? There have been five great rulers, if you will, that have pushed the cause of this woman, that have created great fornication with her, or committed great fornication with her. And as a result, she has used them to ultimately get to the point where she realizes the fullness of her dream, which is a one worldwide universal church regardless of what you speak regardless of where you live everybody 
can accessibly come in and worship one thing, which is what? The Antichrist. That's where it will come to fruition, is with the Antichrist. The Antichrist who said anybody that doesn't bow down to him, that doesn't worship him, that if they're not in line with the Antichrist, they don't take his mark or his name and their head or their hand, what's the Bible say before this? He's going to do it to them. Kill them. So how's this woman continues to drive out in the wilderness? She says, that's the one that I've been talking about. He's the one that I've told you all has always been the true God. Well, it says, five are fallen and one is. If you go back, John's talking about, or this angel's talking to John during the Roman Empire. There were five great empires before that. You know what one of them was? Babylon the Great. There were five great empires that caused her to spread her reach. Rome was the sixth, and then one was coming after that that would give access to the rest of the world. Says the other has not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Who's that? The Antichrist. You know what made religion a worldwide endeavor? Used to religion was where you were born, where you grew up. That's where you got your religion from. It's how you were raised. Every community had a singular, right, church house. And all were expected to become not only participants, but partakers. Of not just involved, you were supposed to be in it. Well, in Israel's day, that one place, right, God's temple, what happened to it? It was filled with idols and fornications and idolatries. And what happened? Those places were destroyed. They were crumbled. All evidence of them were trodden under feet. And then what would people believe? Whatever the person sitting on the throne said, they had to believe. They would not believe the one that sat upon the throne of heaven. So they looked to the one that sits on the throne of earth, or their town, or their community. And what did they say? Well, they've got more power. They must know what's right. Why do you think that all started? It all started with empires. If we can just get everybody to agree on who God is, then that'll settle most of the problem. For a long time it worked. For a very long time it worked. Those people that realized that it was a lie still didn't get it all the way right. Who are they? They're called the Protestants. Well, you know where they still take the root of their belief from? A harlot. Even though they realized that what they were taught doesn't line up with what this says, they still didn't rely upon what this says. They took something that was born in fornication and tried to turn it into something that was right, and it's still corrupt. The only thing that's pure, the only thing that's right, is what God planted through His Son. The true vine. The living vine. Anything that comes off anything else is what? It's fornication. The product of a harlot. But what was the most recent stupid holiday that everybody celebrated? St. Patrick's Day. You know why that's a thing? Because the Catholic Church had to come up with a name or with a title, right, to incorporate this dude named Patrick from Ireland to keep all the Irish people happy because they thought he was very important and they thought that he was worthy of praise and worship for what he had done. So what they do? They turned him into a saint. They said, oh yeah, he's a, he's a religious figure now. Just keep buying into our church. And all the Irish are like, see, we knew that that guy was special and they admitted it. All right, we're going to celebrate that holiday. Catholics don't care as long as you're not trying to tear down the building to run them out of town. Where do you think she got all, them, all that gold and all those pearls and everything else? People came and brought it to them as tithes. 
And when they wouldn't let go of it willingly, what do you think they did? They sent guys like Ponce de Leon and Christopher Columbus and Pizarro and all these other people to distant lands to civilize the savages. And part of that civilizing process is we're going to take all the gold you got and take it back to Europe. If you don't agree with us, what do you get? This thing called the Spanish Inquisition. If you don't fall in line, we're going to send people throughout France during the French Revolution that if you're accused of being a part of the elite or part of the chosen, all we got to do is even just send a whiff that you've got more authority or you're trying to tell somebody else what to do. Who do you think a lot of the people that went to the guillotine were? During the 1780s, by the way. America was a country by this point. Who do you think a lot of the people that went, well, there were people standing up saying, thus saith the Lord. They think they know better than us. Chop the head off. Do you think the Jews were the only religious minority that were persecuted during the Nazi regime? No. Do you think... That war, I mean, I wish I could tell you. Every modern day war, all the way back to any time that there was a dispute about religion. But since Jesus left this world, you know how many wars have been fought over the simple issue of whether or not it's right to participate in infant baptism or in a believer's baptism? How many people died? Because one person gave a command and said, they're infidels, go kill them. You know how I many people have died arguing over who has the right to Jerusalem as their holy city? Well, there's only one that's got a real claim to it. But even those religions that now are not a part of a universal church doesn't mean that they're going to be added to the universal church. Keep that in mind. I don't think that the only people that are going to be killed and martyred during the Great Tribulation are people that believe in Jesus. Some of them are going to die because they believe in Allah. Some of them are going to die because they refuse to let go of Confucius. Some of them are going to die because they refuse to let go of Buddha. But all those that are left are what? A one world unified universal church. And what's that? That's the final thing she's been waiting on. It's what she's been praying for. What she's been biding her time. It was the plan that she started all the way in the beginning. And what'd she do? Just like the Romans came in and took what was the Greeks and gave it new names. Oh yeah, your God, it's the same as ours. But if you really want to go all the way back to the woman with the baby that's portrayed in most Catholic churches today, they'll tell you it's Mary. Not really Mary. It goes all the way back to Egyptian deities. Now a woman whose husband was killed went and reassembled all of his body parts. And after she did that, she was able to conceive a son even though he was dead. What's that sound like? Sounds like a right, miraculous conception. And then her son was worshipped as the king of all of the kings, the god of all of the gods. His name was Horus. It was the sun god. You go all throughout the world, why does so many of the world's religion, their chief deity has to deal with light or sun or something that comes from the sky? Well, it's because throughout time, long before Horus existed, there was another name for him and another name for him and another name for him. And they came up with other religions. But why do all of these people all around the world that should have their own individual cultures, why do they all have so many similarities? Because the same deceiver that was in the gardens been whispering the same deceits into their ears, and they listened to him. But what do all of those deceits, who got it right? All of those deceits and the fornication, the one that understood how to make it happen 
May not by the time that those verses come true, but right now we would consider the Catholic Church, the harlot of harlot, the one who's killed more saints than any other religion could have ever dreamed about. All to say what? That Mary's in control, not Jesus. That she has power. God gave power to Mary. No, she didn't. What Mary say? Anything Jesus says, you do it. What do they do with all the religions of the world? They take pieces just to appease people and they fit them into their big jigsaw so that what? Everybody can come under one umbrella and worship and then you can go home and do whatever you want to on the weekends. Just come out on Sundays and give us money. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.